Okay, um, so my name is Philippe Golden, and um, I am uh, born in the United States, born in New York City, and I was great, very um, wonderful that I had the opportunity to travel to India and Nepal during my university years, and really the inspiration there was my mother, who at the age of 50 uh, decided to take off by herself and travel into Nepal and India, and when she came back, she was very clear that I should travel there. So she was adamant. And I did my junior and my senior year of university in Nepal through the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, they had a program to go live in India, Nepal. And so I went, ended up doing my junior and my senior year of university in Nepal, where I was really introduced into Buddhism, uh, Islam, Hinduism. I started studying Sanskrit, Nepali language, Tibetan language and then started doing retreats at Tibetan Buddhist centers and ended up doing a uh, one-month uh, meditation retreat at a Kopan Monastery, just on the edge of Kathmandu. And that was my real first exposure to Buddhism, uh, India, Nepal, uh, Tibetan culture. And then I was so smitten with this that I thought I should do a continue in doing Asian studies. So I went back to Madison, Wisconsin, and I studied with Geshe Sopa, who had, uh, at that time was a professor uh, and also a Tibetan Buddhist monk. And after one year, he had a Fulbright to go back to Tibet to visit his teacher and in Lhasa, the capital. And he asked me if I would go with him because he wanted a helper. And I was very happy to do so. And I ended up going and spending about three, four months uh, in Tibet part of the time with him and sometime actually on my own, just traveling around. And of course, that was an amazing experience to dive you know, in, deeper into the history and meet people, talk to people, uh, go to um, very you know, pilgrimage sites and so forth. Um, when I came back to the United States, I actually uh, ended up going back to New York and working for Tibet House in New York City. And that was a whole other kind of exposure um, because I was, working with different groups of monks from different monasteries who were doing sand mandalas, like actually monks from Namgyal Monastery, giving ritual dance, Kala Chakra, teachings, etc. Um, one of the interesting stories is that I was coming home from work one day when I was working at a foundation, and I saw a Tibetan Buddhist monk on the subway in Manhattan. And I went up to him and I started speaking in Tibetan, and it turns out he was from Namgyal Monastery, he had been an attendant to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and he was sent to New York to work with an arts foundation to work with people on creating a book about the Kala Chakra ritual. So we became friends, and then I ended up becoming his translator and helping him unpack uh, many different levels of the Kala Chakra, which is a fantastic experience, of course. And he was a master in making sand mandalas and also doing like ritual dance. I ended up... Um, going to India with my mom. We thought that we would go just for a couple of months during the public teachings by Sonas the Dalai Lama in the, new, it's the, the first full moon uh, of the new year, according to the lunar calendar. Um, I ended up staying for almost four years. And I ended up living in Namgyal Monastery um, that whole time, well, almost for three years. And right across the street at that time was the... Um, the uh, debate school, Tsenilapta. <clears throat> so I actually ended up uh, spending two years studying texts, analytic debate, um, debate language, <laughs> and having a lot of fun and learning and doing retreats and so forth. And when my Tibetan really got good enough, I started translating um, both for public and private teachings for different Tibetan lamas in Dharamsala. Um, so I did that and then ended up uh, going to uh, Mustang in Nepal on the border with Tibet. Very important um, city uh, in, his, historically. And there was an English uh, film crew that wanted to make a film, and they wanted a Tibetan Lama who would become True Rinpoche, a Nyingma Lama who lives in Dharamsala. And I had been translating for him, and he asked if I would be his translator on this film, this documentary. So I went with him and we spent um, 
one entire summer growing up to <laughs> Mustang and learn, like looking at old monasteries, caves, meeting people, the king of Bhutan and his family, mean, the king of uh, Mustang and his family. And that was a very moving experience. Um, but then I, it was September 1993, and I thought I would move to Sweden. I decided to move to Sweden because I'd met someone, and I came to Sweden and uh, for one year did history of religions. Then I moved back to New York City, where I'm from, and I thought, what am I doing with my life? And I ended up quickly applying for a PhD program in clinical psychology. And from day one, I did psychology, clinical psychology, neuroscience, and experimental, and did a PhD and did lots of different research projects and so forth, um, including working with adults who um, had AIDS or HIV virus, <coughs> HIV. And we, we did a lot of uh, actually death meditation practice with them to really bring up this idea of per impermanence and acceptance of change. And one of the most fascinating, thing, fascinating things there was we thought people would be very anxious or fearful about the dying. And when we debriefed, this was over eight weeks, we were actually mistaken. The issue that was the most powerful, and the reason I share this is because it's very poignant, is um, they were more um, fearful or worried about not having lived fully. And it was not death that was the problem. It was really reflecting back on what have I done. Um, ended up getting my PhD in psychology, um, spent time at University of California, San Diego, doing clinical internship, postdoctoral studies at Stanford, diving deeper and deeper into brain imaging and research. And <clears throat> that's where I really began to bring neuroimaging tools, my interest in treating people with anxiety and depression, and both psychotherapeutic practices, but also different kinds of meditation techniques to really try to empirically analyze how do these different techniques uh, work in the brain and in people's emotional experiences, how do they influence different types of emotion regulation strategies, and how, do, and how do different meditation techniques differ from what's done in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is considered the gold standard form of psychotherapy for depression and anxiety. And then um, from there, I actually, after a decade at Stanford, I shifted and became a um, professor at University of California, Davis, where I am now, and have continued to use different neuroimaging tools, with different populations to try to understand how do different practices, contemplative technologies, if you want to say, function, how do they influence different forms of attention, emotion awareness, emotion regulation, even views of self. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful that I've uh, had the opportunity to, to bring many different streams of things that I love and to combine them and to investigate. 